COVID in our state. And uh, there have been a number of developments, but basically we're not in, in foreign territory. We've been down this path before and there's a lot of trends that we're seeing and some concerns we have, especially as I spoke to you last time, it was all about getting the kids back in school. In many, many places, the children are back in school, which I think is incredible. And I commend all the school administrators and school superintendents and school boards, teachers and parents and everybody who had to go through a lot of anxiety to make this happen. But it's the right place for our children to be. And we wanna make sure that they are following our, our uh, directive that everyone in a school setting be wearing their masks. That is something that we launched a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago when I first took office to make sure that everyone is as safe as they can be. We are continuing to push vaccinations and I'll give you some statistics on how we're doing on those numbers as well. So school season's underway. Um, we're also looking forward to making sure that we get people back to work and we're seeing our ridership up, uh, at least setting records in our New York City transit, our subway, our Metro North and Long Island Railroad. We've set some records there as well. Again, these are COVID records. Uh, these are not uh, the records we would have hit in the past, but again, we're trying to do the best we can. Uh, we're gonna continue to monitor the numbers very close. We always have uh, sort of maintaining the status quo we've been over the last few days, a little bit over 3% statewide. Individual areas we're concerned about, we're in conversations with the leaders locally to see if they need anything from the state. And uh, we're watching, make sure particularly areas like the North Country, Western New York, Finger Lakes and Long Island, and the Capital Region. Uh, let's see if we can continue to drive those numbers down in terms of our positivity rates. And our highest area again is the North Country, 5.6%. New York City is doing very well. I just got in from New York City this morning and it's uh, heartwarming to see people walking down the streets, outdoors, wearing their masks and inside the restaurants, showing their vaccination proof before they're served food as I was in a diner late last night. Um, let's see our COVID hospitalizations. Again, this was a huge area of anxiety for us last year. Again, we had to ramp up to surge. We had to make sure they had enough staff. We had to make sure they had enough protective equipment. And as you look at this graph, we are in a far better place. Uh, the hospitalizations are nowhere near what they were last time. And the only reason is one, because people are vaccinated now. And that is the difference between this year and last year. The deaths continue to uh, be there. We lost 31 people just yesterday, and that is actually very tragic. And I uh, lost someone rather close to me as well. So it's people that are uh, still succumbing to this and it's painful for everyone. We also wanna make sure that uh, we are monitoring very closely the hospital capacity overall. We're in a good shape. We are still in good shape. We know that every one of these hospitals, if necessary, can ramp up again to surge capacity, which means increasing their capacity by 50%. And so we wanna make sure that that continues. That's going to give us the, the confidence to know that we can handle what's on the horizon, but if these numbers start changing, we're gonna to have to make some more decisions with respect to our hospitals and they're ready. This will not be new to them and they're watching the numbers just as closely as we are to make sure we have enough hospital beds available if necessary and ICU beds in particular. Vaccination, we're getting better my friends, we're getting better. 82% uh, 18 plus with at least one dose, fantastic. Uh, still concerned about our young people 63% to 12 to 17 year olds and uh, the completed series 73% and the numbers keep trending upward, particularly since there have been more vaccine mandates. Uh, that is having an effect on people's decisions and that's exactly what we wanted to have. If you did not know enough on your own to do this because it was the right thing to do to protect yourself, protect your family and to get us out of this, this long slumber known as the, uh, the COVID pandemic, then at least some of you are doing it now because it's a requirement of your jobs. And that's what the effect is we wanted to have. And we're seeing the numbers go up there as well. I still wanna see them go up. We're gonna continue pushing that. We're gonna continue finding creative ways to make sure that that happens, especially with our teenagers. Teenagers have to be higher than those numbers. And we know that vaccines work. Uh, here are the numbers. If you're, not, if you're not fully vaccinated, you're 10 times more likely to be hospitalized. Let me repeat that, 10 times more likely to be hospitalized if you have not been vaccinated and 11 times more likely to die. I'm not sure who wants to play with that Russian roulette. I don't know why anyone knowing that, knowing that you're highly vulnerable uh, to being 
succumbing to this, having the infection in the first place, and it's not fun to have even if you're not hospitalized. And we also are still studying the long-term effect, the long haulers, if you will. So why would you take this gamble in the first place, but also uh, statistically far more likely to die, and uh, that's according to the CDC. People are concerned about breakthrough infections, and there's some people that are trying to make an argument that, well, there's breakthrough, so why get vaccinated it proves they don't work. That is a false narrative. It's been spun around on social media. We need to shut that down. Uh, there can be breakthrough. They're rare. They usually have very minor symptoms, and I'm monitoring whether or not those breakthroughs are increasing. You can see it went up, just ticked up a tiny bit, but in terms of who's hospitalized, uh, these are not the people who've been vaccinated. Uh, it's a very, very small percentage, and usually people with underlying conditions would fall into that category. Okay, again, I mentioned the young people. Uh, we want to get those numbers up higher, and we're going to be focusing on some ways to convince them. Fully vaccinated, still only 52%. So how do we get younger people vaccinated? Well, we're trying to get creative. I've been in the city a lot, and I know that there's something very exciting going on, known as the governor's ball. I didn't start this, uh, but I will take full credit for the excitement that's behind it. Uh, Billy Eilish is going to be there, and uh, Post Malone, and so I think there's going to be a lot of people want these tickets. So uh, we're just you know, trying to find places all over the state, and this is to kick off uh, getting young people excited, at least having a shot at 125 tickets to come to the Governor's Ball, which is a big, big concert, a, a lot of excitement around that in the city. So there's the details on that. And let's just step back and see where we are. We had a gorgeous summer. Very nice, and uh, still feels like it in some parts of our state with the, the heat continuing. But fall and winter, as we saw from last year, again, I feel like we're replaying the same movie as last year, um, but it has a better outcome because we now are better prepared and have the vaccines. But still, people are coming indoors, congregating more closely together. And we also know we have some events, I and mean, we saw a spike go up last year. What triggered it? Halloween. Who would have thought that people gathering on a Halloween would precipitate a spike? But that's exactly when the numbers started going up. You saw what happened when people gathered at Thanksgiving. We tried to tell people to gather uh, very in small settings, not to congregate in large uh, gatherings with family and friends. I think a lot of people didn't listen to us, and we went all the way to New Year's Eve, but we just had a heck of a spike. A lot of people were hospitalized. The infection rate was uh, almost 9% at the time. Again, this was pre-vaccine, so people contracting it, it was a very frightening diagnosis because uh, you know, so we lost so many people last year. So there's still a big question mark on sending into that same season right now. Um, you know, we know that you know, these same holidays are coming, and we only saw the spike go down last year when the Super Bowl was over, and people stopped getting together for those. I would encourage people to have these celebrations, have fun if you are vaccinated. And that is the big difference between 2021 and 2122. If you're vaccinated, these should be safe occurrences, but continue wearing masks so we can avoid breakthroughs. But this is in the control of New Yorkers. I can't control what that number is going to look like when we have an assessment after the next year's Super Bowl. And I know who I'm rooting for in that, but that's another whole topic. Um, so let's be smart. New Yorkers, let's just be really smart about it. We have the control, we have the power, we have the tools to make sure that that flatlines, that that number absolutely flatlines. So we have a vulnerable time coming forward. I'm sending out the alarm right now. New Yorkers, pay attention. If you know people who are not vaccinated, persuade them that it is not going to be fun to spend the winter on a ventilator. Uh, there's a way they can prevent that, and that means getting vaccinated now. We talked last time about whether or not there's variants that are of concern to us, and as we head into fall, we want to make sure that uh, we're monitoring this. I have not seen a difference. We've not seen a difference in the state of New York as far as the mu variant, and that was the most recent one identified by the CDC. We, we're no, following it, tracking it here in Albany in our Wadsworth labs as well. But I will keep you all apprised if we start to see any more uh, variants of interest or concern that have been added to the World Health Organization's list. So we talked about boosters. We're getting closer. Uh, again, following what the federal government is telling us, you know, we have been, the latest we've been told is they are on, on track to approve booster shots for people beginning on September 20th. If they approve it, we'll be ready. And I wanted to make sure that all of our local health agencies knew that our expectation is very high, that they put the infrastructure in place. Because if they've told me all through last year, they know how to do this. They're well prepared. They do flu shots. They've done other vaccinations. They've done other uh, health crises before, this is what they do and do best.
but I will always have the resources of the state to back them up. We can continue some of our mass vaccination sites uh, to make it easier on people, pop-ups, some drive-throughs. We'll keep that going. But again, I wanted to allocate $65 million to support the local efforts so they're ready. They've already identified over 200 vaccination sites. More will be online. And we've over 8,000 people uh, and providers already enrolled in this. So, so I just want the message to go out. Be aware of when you had your, your last shot. Eight months later, start talking about talk, going to see your doctor, a pharmacist, or take advantage of one of our, we have to stop hitting that, uh, taking advantage of one of our uh, mass vaccination sites will make sure all the information gets out. So I had my shot, I believe it was in March, so I'm watching the calendar as well. So the problem we identify was that we, as we ramp up, and there will be a crush of people, hopefully, who will want the vaccine all at the same time. If you remember last year's trend, December, when they were first available, it was people, highly vulnerable people in nursing homes. Then we started doing people, older age demographics in January, February. It wasn't until March uh, when my age group was allowed. I won't tell you what that is, but you can look it up. And uh, so we're gonna have a real spike. We're gonna have a lot of people all of a sudden who are now eligible. And I don't want it to be a problem, and I wanted to address it before it becomes a problem. So we basically needed more people who are trained and qualified to administer vaccines. And so what we're doing today, and I wanted to announce as today, we are directing the Department of Health to allow basic EMTs to administer vaccines. This is an idea that came out of our local officials. Many county executives told me that they would like to be able to have this ability for their local uh, fire departments and health agencies. And that adds over 2,000 fully trained vaccinators and we have 50,000 now eligible for training. Training is simple. There's a, an online and in-person training. It only takes a few hours and they have to demonstrate their competency at this as well. So anybody who's uh, giving you a jab knows what they're doing, very important. But it's gonna help alleviate a staffing situation that we're anticipating will be the case. So we wanna get ahead of that, helping the local governments prepare for this as well. But I've seen a lot of good signs lately and it's very, very promising. Well, last night we opened Broadway. Uh, that is, Broadway was the first to shut down and the last to reopen as far as our key uh, industries that help define our state. Everyone comes to New York City, all those 60 million tourists a year who used to come and they all want a ticket to Broadway. So I was there on the stage of Phantom the Opera. I wanted to go there because that's where masks were first really popularized. If you remember the Phantom, uh, years before anybody else thought it was cool to rock a mask, uh, the Phantom of the Opera had a mask on. So we were there, a lot of excitement if you saw the news coverage. We wanna make sure that people are safe. You had to be vaccinated to go in here. People still wore masks. And we also know how smart this was. So we were able to open this industry, which is really, 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 really hard hit, was hard hit, and I had many conversations with people in that industry. It's important to our economy, it's important to our identity. So it was a big night to get that uh, Broadway open again. Uh, went to baseball games, people being very smart again as well, and wearing their masks, so, and making even outdoors in places where we congregate. So we're gonna continue making um, New York reopen by having people continue wearing masks. And also I wanna commend the organizations and the county executive, Mark Polenkar, as we tweeted, him this morning uh, for being smart and basically saying, if you wanna go to a sporting event, even if it's outdoors, because of the large congregation of people, whether it's a Bills game, Sabres game, or other games across the state, you should be vaccinated. We are not, in the, we are not able to mandate that under the more limited um, powers that I have compared to what was allocated to the governor last year by the legislature. That's not a problem. Because I'm, I'm asking everyone to do this. I'm asking every organization, every sports organization to follow this lead and institute a requirement that your fans be vaccinated before they can attend. That's how we're gonna deal with this fall vulnerability. This is where people congregate, big gatherings, a lot of tailgating going on, but if people are there who've been vaccinated, it'll be a far different outcome if we allow people to come who are not. Also, uh, right now, here's to talk about masks. You have to wear masks in schools, certain healthcare settings, at correctional facilities, homeless shelters, our transportation hubs. Uh, that is not new, but we also wanna make sure that we expand this and starting today, we're going to require masks at childcare and daycare centers because if you're watching the national news, the, uh, the scariest announcements coming out every single morning are the number of children now contracting COVID and we don't have a vaccine available for five to 11 year olds. I am very anxious to get this approved. And as soon as it is, we'll be working with parents and 
pediatricians and schools to make sure that the children are vaccinated, but we're not hearing that that'll occur for a number of months yet. So we wanna make sure that even people in our state congregate facilities, our mental health facilities, uh, residential substance abuse facilities are all uh, getting wearing their masks so we can protect uh, staff and, uh, and all the individuals who would enter those facilities. And that's effective today. And uh, here's the final message. We all want this to be over. Everybody's tired of it. It's been a long, long, long haul. And the great news is, is we have the power to end this. If every single person in New York State who is eligible, and that is everybody over the age of 12, would simply get their vaccine and then prepare to get their booster, we could get through this like this. We could show the rest of the nation what enlightened people look like, what they act like, what they do. They get vaccinated, they protect themselves, and they protect each other, and we can start bringing back this economy. It has been too long, my friends. We can do it. There's nothing stopping us, and I want to get it done. Let's do it together. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Uh, first question, Marina at AP. Marina. Hi, Governor. Um, the Treasury yesterday said it's going to be sending more rent relief money to states that are putting aside, uh, that are spending a lot of money, not necessarily to states that are putting aside a lot of money. Are you worried about New York missing out on money? And what are the biggest barriers that your administration has found that's kept money from going out the doors? Um, and what are you doing to reach reluctant landlords? Uh, everything. And I will tell you, we are going at this with an intensity that I don't think the state government has ever seen. When I first took office three weeks ago yesterday, we'd only allocated $200 million of the possible $2.4 billion. And I can go into all the reasons, but it's a long saga of uh, inefficiencies, but also some additional regulations that have been put in place by the legislature. But nobody cares about excuses, particularly me. Since I've been in office three weeks, we've actually doubled that amount. We've done in the last three weeks what was accomplished in the previous months. So we're over at, um, we have over $400 million out right now and, and accounted for, and, uh, let me make sure I get the numbers right. Uh, we have 399, I don't want to exaggerate, 399 million is out the door to landlords as of today. So we've wrapped up our on the ground efforts. I hired an additional 100 people. We've been working with local organizations, literally hiring 80 organizations who have boots on the ground going door to door. And I was so laser focused on this making sure that people understood that there's money available to them to get to the landlords, to make the landlords whole for this long time that they've had to endure non-payments because people lost their jobs. And what we did was even after the hurricane, uh, we had people going door to door to see if people were safe and if they needed FEMA money. And I worked with the city on this. I said, while we're sending people out to talk about FEMA relief in flooded areas, take the forms. A lot of these people are renters. So I'm very targeted on using all the resources at our disposal, even people going to the door for Meals on Wheels, take these forms with them. So we have been really um, aggressive in our approach, working with the city, partnering with the city, what a radical concept, but we're doing it to make sure that the information gets out, city of New York, but also cities all over the state of New York. So if there's more money to be had, I'll apply for more. We actually added more money to the pot when I convened the executive, uh, the, the um, extraordinary session of the legislature we added additional $125 million so we could increase the income threshold a little bit because there were still too many people that were not eligible because their incomes were too, were too high. So that money starting September 14th, yesterday, uh, applications are now available for that as well. So we're, we're on it, but there's an opportunity to play for more. I think we're going to need more. I think we're gonna to continue to need more because all of this is premised on the fact that we will get the money out so we can end the moratorium January 15th as promised. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, Governor, do you think J-COPE should be, with everything yesterday, do you think J-COPE should be replaced by something completely different? And have, do you think it's possible for an agency to police itself or Albany to police itself? I said that day one. I said one, what I'm going to do is turn it upside down and to challenge the premise that an entity that is created by elected officials with their own appointees should be charged with investigating those individuals should circumstances arise. The whole premise behind it is, is flawed. And what I had to, do, had to do most recently, as much as I would have preferred not to, just I'd rather have had the time to reform it and turn it upside down and start over literally, 
with input from our elected officials, our good government groups, and everybody else who has an opinion on this. Because most New Yorkers question why you'd have elected officials picking the people charged with investigating or, or evaluating their work. But what happened yesterday was as a result of two resignations, in order for there to be any business going forward, I had to appoint somebody. And that is the circumstance we were in yesterday. I had to find an individual, an individual who is highly recommended, has credentials, but literally is unknown to me. You know, I wanna make sure that we are not stacking these bodies with our friends and with our allies as had been the past. Because again, you're not going to restore the trust of the people of New York if you keep playing the same games that have been played over and over and over. It's starting here, right now. Governor, what's yes, your please. position on the efforts to claw back the $5.1 million that former Governor Cuomo received as a result of his book deal? And also going back to that j vote, there was an effort to claw it back and it failed. And one of the deciding votes against that was by James Deering after you elevated him to the acting chair. So what's your position on that and also how come there wasn't um, another commissioner appointed to make the board full, um, especially as eight uh, votes are needed in order for a motion to pass? We are absolutely going to be doing the proper vetting to find individuals. These, res these resignations occurred. I had to take some time to find individuals who would agree to do this, who would have the objectivity that I'm looking for and not being connected individuals. We were able to find the individual necessary to allow there to be sufficient individuals to allow the work to continue, and that's what happened yesterday. Uh, I'm not gonna render opinions because I don't think it's my place to do so. And if anyone's going to question my independence from this, start by the statement I'm offering right now. I will not interfere with that, what Jabe Cope does. I'm not going to comment on their investigation. That's wildly inappropriate for me to do so. Now, if someone's gonna infer from that that I'm trying to cut a better deal for the governor, I think it's well known that uh, we've not been close and I would, what is my interest in doing so? Someone would have to ask that question. So before people make certain assumptions that are highly erroneous, they are wrong. I'm gonna let them know right now they're wrong. But I'm gonna to continue to hold myself with the highest levels of integrity as I'm gonna hold everyone in this government and me interfering in that is inappropriate and I'm not going to do it. I'm not gonna start now and I'm not gonna do it later. That is not, should, that's not how we should be using what is supposed to be an independent organization, but before I'm all done, it will be an independent organization. Uh, Governor, um, there's been some, you've talked a lot of it just now about vaccinations. There's some concern among some healthcare providers that vaccine mandates are causing them to lose staff when uh, staff are hard to come by, particularly in nursing homes. So I'm wondering if you could, on, on the vaccination front, uh, if, if there are gonna be booster shots for the general public, will people requiring their first series of vaccinations still get some kind of priority uh, mm. at state sites? Mm. Do you plan on setting up mass sites? Do you plan on a, a system that would, would allow for more signups earlier? Last time there were people going from Long Island to Plattsburgh and not for the, uh, the tourism aspect of it. And, and then also you talked about the youths um, and their low rates you mentioned maybe a vaccine mandate. Any updates to your thinking there uh, about, um, about what, what needs to be done to get kids okay. to do it? On kids, again, many more people did get vaccinated because they were coming back to school. And I would also say we can do better and I'm, not, I'm still keeping all the options on the table, Jimmy, I really am. I'm gonna keep that as an option. I'm watching the numbers to see if the number of children with infection starts increasing in the state of New York and particularly not just infections, but hospitalizations. Because I know this is an area of great sensitivity for parents, and I'm not looking to trample on their rights as parents, but I also need to do more to convince the parents that this is, this is what has to happen for your child to have a healthy, healthy existence while they're in schools, because they are exposed in schools, they're around other people. So I'm keeping that option on the table. It's still in my mind. I've not taken any steps to further that. In terms of whether or not we're going to basically have a capacity problem like we witnessed last year. And I was, I, I saw that, I went to every single site and I saw the anxiety people felt early on of not being able to get uh, that appointment and having to travel great distance. We are in a far, far better place this year. And I'm really proud of that, that the workers who put themselves out there last year, they're signing up again, they're ready to staff the sites. And now that we're not 
mandating that it was all state-run facilities and only state-run employees that were actually involving the local individuals who were shunted off to the side. There are far more people that are engaged in this and even in a lot, the EMTs, I mean, we'll have 50,000 people after very brief training who will be able to be part of this army. And I also spoke to representatives from Pfizer a few days ago asking, what is the supply going to be? Am I gonna have to worry about rationing this? I mean, what's, are we gonna end up in the same place? They assured me, and again, this is a spokesperson for Pfizer, but they assured me that there will not be a supply problem, that they have been ramping up, that they actually have uh, plenty for us to be able to do the booster shots. I'm gonna keep tracking that. That's what I'm told now. I wanna see if that changes, but I do not want people to deal with that, that specter of the, what they had to deal with last year. You should be able to go to your doctor's office. You should be able to go to a, a site. You should be able to go, and we'll have the pop-up sites at churches and senior centers. So I'm not anticipating that to be a problem. Um, but on the other hand, we're preparing as if it is. Also, to go back, the, the mandates for healthcare workers oh, yeah, again, yeah. the 27th. Yeah. Um, and also, I noticed Dr. Zucker's not here. Should we read anything into that? I, I know, firstly, um, that, that there are providers who have expressed concern to DOH about this mandate. Um, do you plan, or does he plan, any amendments to, to what was authorized? I believe the mandates are smart. I still believe that they, have, they are one of the reasons we're having an increase in the number of people getting vaccinated. I've heard that from hospitals. They're seeing more of their healthcare workers who are on the fence, taking their time, evaluating, and so we are having the effect we want. Yes, there'll be some individuals who will um, try to defy this. There'll be court decisions that will appeal. We're going to continue appealing those and trying to uh, win on the merits in the case we just had in the Northern District of New York. We'll, we'll deal with that in court on September 27th or 8th. Um, it's a smart thing to do. We have to continue the mandates. And if there are staffing shortages, I've already had conversations. We've been alerted that there is a hospital in Lewis County that may not be able to deliver babies. I checked. Every baby is supposed to be delivered in Lewis County has been properly delivered. And we'll also send resources. And this won't happen for a couple weeks anyhow. This was just anticipatory that the requirement goes into effect in a couple weeks. We'll be on it. I'm not letting this, I'm not gonna let this be a problem for the state of New York. I will make sure that we have the resources and people are required to have temporary staffing plans anyhow. School, hospitals are required to have a game plan if they end up, you know, what if a mass flu hit a whole hospital and they had to have it a staffing issue. They need to prepare for this but I'll be there to help with the Department of Health. Okay, you, yes. We're gonna take oh, some questions oh, via Zoom. Okay, we got a Zoom question, okay. Yeah, we got a quick question. Real quick, right. Sarah, right. related to the question. With the, the court case about the religious exemption for healthcare workers, do you think that they should be allowed to have a religious exemption not to get vaccinated? We left off that in our regulations uh, intentionally, and we believe that uh, they're, um, this is my personal opinion, because I'm gonna you know, we'll be defending this in court. To the extent that there's leadership of different religious organizations that have spoken, and they have, uh, I'm not aware of a uh, sanctioned religious exemption from any organized religion. In fact, they've, they're encouraging the opposite. They're encouraging their members, everybody from the Pope on down is encouraging people to get vaccinated. So people will say what they choose. Um, we are gonna make sure that we defend the right of state of New York to ensure that anyone in a healthcare facility can meet a patient and that patient does not have to worry when they go in there for healthcare that they're gonna contract a virus from one of the people who are supposed to protect their health. That doesn't make sense and we're gonna continue going to court. I'll take your question, we'll go to online. Governor, I wanted to ask about the negotiations about the Bill Stadium. Um, to what extent is the deal with the Bills, um, about, some, about the city's emotional attachment to the team versus economics, economical reasons for keeping them? And what do you say to the criticism that your administration has not been fully transparent about the potential cost to taxpayers that could exceed more than a billion dollars once it's set no, up? No, this is, this is what's happening right now. We're still in the fact-finding phase where there are experts conducting studies on the cost of a new stadium, still showing us the numbers on a cost of... Um, of renovations, repairs on the existing ones, locations. So that is all the information we've asked for. We've had many conversations, still, still just gathering data. So in terms of transparency, we're asking just questions so we have a full picture of what we're dealing with. And does, does the price tag, for example, include 
the removal of the existing stadium. You know, is that number of infected? We want the full picture, and they're just they're working on that. And there is a strong economic impact to any sports team in a community. I mean, Buffalo Bills. I was, you know, I was uh, at the City Field a couple days ago. You know, with Mets and Yankees, and I, I and I, I, I know, and I'm a big sports fan. All sports. Please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your window, and uh, we'll be with you in just a second. Chris, you're good to go. Chris Horvatis from WIVB TV. Chris, your mic is open. Hi, Governor. Hi, uh, I wanted to follow up on Jimmy's question as well. I spoke with a assisted care facility in Chautauqua County yesterday. They're worried about losing a third of their staff over the uh, vaccine mandate. I want to stress I'm not asking about the validity of the mandate itself, but I want to try to nail down what can or what will this state what resources will the state be sending facilities like that to help them with these staffing shortages that they fear? Again, last year they were supposed to have a plan that allowed them to increase their capacity by 50%. They still have those plans and they're supposed to have temporary staffing plans available. And maybe it's incumbent upon us right now to make sure that they're actually following what they're supposed to do to be prepared. That being said, I have actually had conversations with the Department of Health and everyone in healthcare in the state of New York to figure out how we can send support if necessary. But that is a frightening number to think that if you go into a hospital in a place like that, that one third of the people taking care of you may not be vaccinated. I think that people need to start realizing that when you stand up and say, I wanna be a public health official in any capacity, uh, we count on you to be healthy yourselves and to make sure that we don't spread the vaccine. So I'm, I'm pleading with them to understand that this is not intended to be dictatorial. It's intended to save lives and to allow you to do something that you're obviously passionate about or else you wouldn't be in the healing profession, whether you're a nurse, a doctor, an orderly or anyone who's in that institution. You know you care about people and this is how you can demonstrate it in a most beautiful way. Okay, we just have time for one more question. Governor Andrew Siff is your next question from WNBC in New York. Andrew. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, there was a similar term. Andrew, you're breaking up. We're catching a half of every other word. So. Can anybody pick up on that? No. Well, then we're going to, Andrew, get going once, going twice. Just, right. I'm trying, Andrew, I'm trying. Just wondering if you think the date of the mandate will be affected by the court decision. The date, the mandate will be affected by the court decision. The, the Northern District of New York decision related to religious exemptions, is that what you're referring to? Yes, co correct. Well, the effective date of the order for the vaccinations is September 27th. And I believe we have a court appearance on the 28th, and we're hoping that we will make uh, overwhelmingly persuasive arguments in support of allowing the state of New York to do what is necessary to protect the public health. So uh, that is the timetable that we're looking at. And I'll take one from you, then we gotta go. Thank okay. you, um, It's 50 years since the Attica riots. Uh, families have sought for decades to get the state to apologize. Is that something you're prepared to do or considering doing? We have had a lot of outreach with uh, everyone affected by this. And it is a, a sad day for all of us to remember what happened 50 years ago, those of us who are old enough. And I actually, as a teenager, as an intern, went and saw the trials in person. So this is personal to me. And I know that there were a lot of lives just shattered, destroyed, and the memories still linger, whether you were a corrections officer in that desperate situation or you were a prisoner who was a victim of what occurred there at this time. So uh, I'd like to have uh, private conversations with many of the people affected. I know this is the 50th anniversary week of the trials. They started 50 years ago last week. So uh, it's something that's very much on my mind and we're, and we're dealing with it. Thank you everybody, appreciate you coming out.